My name is Chris Jones, and I am a grieving mom. And you came in today to share a story with us. Would you like to share that story? Sure, sure. Um, so it's the story of my son, Brandon Rowe. Um, he was a very laid back kind of guy. Um, as a young child, he was always out to please. Um, really, he was a good kid. Um, you know, he wasn't one to get in a bunch of trouble. He was a straight A student in elementary school. And when he got to middle school, of course, he got picked on a little more in middle school than he did in elementary. <clears throat> um, in elementary, he wore a suit and tie to school every day. Um, but as he got to middle school, he got picked on for it, so he stopped doing it. So he um, reminded me a lot of my father and my grandfather because he had that laid back persona and, you know, a very soft spoken, loving, affectionate kind of guy. Um, I always say he was. Um, an old soul in a young man's body. Um, so anyway, Brandon's um, addiction started when he was 14. He got his first alcohol citation at 14 years old. Um, alcohol then progressed into marijuana when he was 15. And when he was 15 and nine months old, he was introduced to morphine. That was his first opiate. Um, he got that opiate from his best friend's mother, um, which it was given to him. So that started his downward spiral. That's when he started getting in trouble with the law. Um, and his addiction just got out of hand. He, um, at 17, he uh, got charged with multiple felonies. He had uh, broke into the barn of um, Steve Ashadi, the ra owner of the Ravens football team, mm -hmm. um, down on Spaniards Neck Road. And he stole three four-wheelers. So he had a lot of felonies on him for that. Um, he was charged as a juvenile, went through the juvenile court system, and was put on house arrest. So while he was on house arrest, um, he had his drug dealer delivering him pills and cocaine to his bedroom window every day. Um, of course, his father didn't know that. Um, his father and I were separated. So Brandon was living with his dad. Um, dad didn't know the extent of what was going on. Of course, at that time, I didn't either. Um, so anyway, Brandon, his addiction progressed. Um, he got really bad off on pills. He, um, at one point, he looked like the walking dead. Um, and I didn't realize it at the time until after he died and I saw a picture. And I was like, wow, my son really looked horrible. So um, his addiction got really bad out of hand. He went through getting charged so many times for theft. Um, you know, because he was working, but all of his money was being spent on drugs and he couldn't pay his bills. So he would go and steal to pay his bills or to get more drugs, one or the other. Um, so when he, March of 2015, um, I had him arrested for stealing from me. Um, I had found that I had some jewelry missing. 
and him and his then girlfriend were living with me. And so I knew they had stolen it. Nobody else had been in my house. So I knew that it was them that had done it. And I confronted them, naturally. They denied, denied, deny. Um, so I did one of the hardest things I'd ever done in my life. And I called the law on them. Um, now that was one of the hardest things for me because when Brandon turned 18, I was the worst enabler for him. I enabled him something terrible. Um, you know, I would go buy him weed. I would give him my opiates because I was in pain management. <clears throat> um, you know, I gave him cash all the time. I'd pay his bills, things of that nature. But back then, I was really naive to addiction. Um, and then after, um, after he turned, I think it was, he was, well, it was in 2015, um, I decided I was done with enabling. I went through a 12-step program, Celebrate Recovery, and um, I stopped enabling. So when I found that he had stolen from me, um, I knew immediately that he was on heroin. Immediately. He had been on pills for years and he had never stolen from me. He had stolen from others, but never from me. Um, as him and I had a bond that just could not be broken. Um, he was a mama's boy and was very proud to be a mama's boy. Um, so anyway, when I found that I had the jewelry missing after confronting the two, the two kids um, and they both denied it, I went to the jewelry store the next day and I was determined I was gonna find my jewelry. So when I got to the jewelry store and told them what I was looking for and who I suspected had turned it in, they said, oh, well, that's um, kind of funny because Actually, your son left his ID here. They had his driver's license, or his ID, in their computer, in their laptop. So I said, well, you know, pull everything that they've pawned. So they did. And the first bag that they poured out, there was like seven or eight bags. The first bag they poured out was my husband's necklace and my mom's praying hands charm. And my mom had been dead for one year. So right then I knew it was heroin because my son would have never done that to me. Um, so that afternoon, I had a choice of either paying the $875 to get my jewelry back or calling the law and having charges pressed. So I called the law and had charges pressed. Um, and I knew Brandon was facing 18 months in jail for violation of probation when he got charged, but I didn't care. I was gonna do whatever I had to do to keep my son from using heroin. Um, he hated me, absolutely hated me. My son had never told me that he hated my guts and that he wished I would die until the day I had him arrested. I was the one that always bailed him out instead of putting him in there. After he was in jail for several months, um, he got past the anger his brain cleared up some and he was able to think properly. And uh, I sent him a letter one day telling him that I wanted to know everything. I wanted to know what kind of drugs he had done, when it started, 
what he'd done to get the drugs. I wanted to know, I wanted details. So, um, I tell everybody now, be careful what you ask your child, because you're not going to be ready for the truth. Um, he wrote me a five-page letter from jail, and I was floored. I had no idea my son had done all these things. Um, that's how I learned everything about my son's addiction, when he started, what it started with. Because he told me in this letter, um, he had gotten so bad off that he was robbing people at gunpoint. He was robbing his drug dealers at gunpoint so he could get more drugs, so he wasn't sick. Um, he told me in the letter that When my mom died, he was clean. He was off the pills. Um, but when she died, he couldn't handle the feeling, the pain that he felt from my mom's death. So he started using pills again. Four months and 10 days later, my dad died. He said the pills weren't helping him anymore. So that's when he turned to heroin. And after three days of using heroin, he was sick. And he couldn't stop using the heroin because if he stopped using it, he was extremely sick from it. So that's when his heroin addiction started. Um, July, my dad died July 31st of 2014. So his heroin addiction started in August of 2014. Um, and I had no idea. I had no idea. I thought he was still on pills, but I didn't know he was on heroin. Um, until I got this letter. He told me in the letter that he was so tired of being sick all the time, that there were many days he would sit in his recliner in his living room with a loaded handgun, wanting to kill himself because he felt like he was such a disappointment to his family because he had gotten on heroin. Um, so Brandon spent some time in jail. He was in jail for uh, 13 months for the charges of um, theft from stealing from my home. Um, he stole a bunch of jewelry and a gun. Um, we were able to get the gun back because he told me where, where he'd sold it at. So after he had spent his time in jail, um, I tried to get him into a sober living home because I didn't want him coming home with me. Um, I knew that if he came back home with me, nothing, it wasn't going to get him away from the environment. So I tried to get him in a sober living home and there was none that were available. None had beds that were available. So he came back to me, um, and he was doing great. He was doing great. He um, had a full-time job working for my husband, running heavy equipment. Um, he was working for the animal shelter in Queenstown. He was taking on part-time jobs, doing odds and ends on um, local horse farms. So he was constantly working. Um, he was saving money. I saw no signs at all of him using again. Um, until the night I found him dead. Um, I was in his room 
talking to him at 12.15 in the morning on November the 4th, 2016, and he was fine. He um, was not high, he had not been drinking, he was completely sober. He was clean in his room. And um, so I did the double knock and went in, like I always did. And he's standing there at his dresser, going through all of his paperwork. And I said, what you doing, buddy? He said, I'm cleaning my room, it's a wreck. So I glanced over and looked on the tote, which is where I always put his clothes at after I'd washed his clothes. And I saw that he had put all of his clothes away that I had just washed two days before. So I knew he was cleaning his room. So um, I said, well, I love you, buddy. I love you too, Mom. <clears throat> so I went out in the living room and I sat down and smoked a cigarette. And after I smoked my cigarette, I turned the lights and the TV off to go to bed. I went down the hallway to use the bathroom, saw that his bedroom light was still on. So I did the double knock and walked in, and he was face down on his bed with a burnt cigarette on the mattress beside him. Initially, I thought he was asleep until I rolled him over and his face was blue. At 12.24, I called 911. I was hitting him in his face, trying to get him to wake up, to just respond to me. And he wouldn't. So while I was on the phone with 911, I opened my bedroom door and jarred my husband out of bed, begging him to come help me. I needed help with Brandon. And we go back in my son's room and I'm on the phone with 911, so I only had one free hand. My husband grabs his feet and I grab one arm and we got him on the floor. And my husband started doing CPR on him and I couldn't watch it. I had to leave the house, I had to go outside. Um, it seemed like it took forever for them to get there, I was begging for Narcan, begging them for Narcan. Eight minutes later, they got there. And um, of course, they wouldn't let me back in the room while the medics were back there working on him. Um, and meanwhile, I'm in the dining room in the kitchen and I'm freaking out. Um, you know, I'm telling the cops, I knew who it was, I knew where he got the drug. Because um, I had talked to the guy in my driveway that night. And I kept telling the cops, either you get him off the street or I will. And then you'll be getting me off the street for murder because I'm gonna kill him. So that night they made my husband remove every gun from my house. Um, because if I said it 20 times, I said it 100 times. I just kept repeating it. Um, anyway, at um, one o'clock that morning, the head paramedic come out and said to me, uh, ma'am, I'm sorry, but we never found any electrical activity. Your son is gone. <laughs> And I immediately collapsed and just screamed. He wasn't just my son, he was my best friend. Um, so I had to wait for a while before we could go back in the room. And, uh, me and my husband and my aunt and 
my nephew and my, um, my son's girlfriend all went back and we were praying over him and naturally I'm a hysterical mess and I'm laying on his chest, hugging him and kissing him and just asking why, why. I remember sitting up and looking at my husband and I was asking for help. And then I felt my eyes roll back in my head and both of my arms went straight up and then I fell back. I went into a full-blown seizure over my son's dead body. And I had never had a seizure before in my life. So I was taken out by ambulance. Um, when I got home, they had already removed my son's body. Several weeks later, of course, the police investigated, drug task force investigated the case. And uh, on June the 4th, 2017, my son's drug dealer was arrested. And uh, he was charged with involuntary manslaughter reckless endangerment, distribution of heroin, distribution of acrofentanyl, possession of heroin, and possession of acrofentanyl. Um, acrofentanyl is synthetic. It's made in, a logo, in an illegal warehouse in China and it is Narcan resistant. All the Narcan in the world wouldn't have saved my son. They gave him three rounds of Narcan that night. They even drilled a hole in his leg and put Narcan directly in his bone marrow. It didn't help. Um, so the drug dealer was charged. He was my son's close friend that he went to school with which I didn't know that at the time. Um, on uh, November 21st and 22nd was his trial. He opted to go in front of a judge and not a jury. And he was found guilty of all six charges. On March 26th of this year, he was sentenced to 30 years in prison, with 18 years suspended to serve 12 for the death of my son. He's the first drug dealer to be convicted of involuntary manslaughter in Queen Anne's County for an overdose death. That was the most difficult thing, having to sit in that courtroom and watch him walk in that courtroom and every time he walked in that courtroom or walked out, he looked at me and smiled. Never admitted that he sold heroin to my son. Still to this day, he swears that he sold marijuana to my son. There was no marijuana in my son's system. Toxicology report does not lie. So, since my son's death, I try to reach out to every parent in Queen Anne's County that loses a child to overdose. Because I know what it feels like. I know the pain. I know the shame. I know the stigma. I've been bashed. I've been called a bad mom. I've been called everything in the book. I've walked away from friends. I've walked away from family. Uh, one of the worst things you can say to me is, 
your son committed suicide. Or he could have just walked away from it. Um, yeah, no, it doesn't work that way. Um, so now I speak to anybody that will listen. I'll scream it from the rooftops. I speak at open seminars. I've recently gone and spoken a rehab, talking directly to the addicts themselves. Um, I try to bring awareness. There's a lot of people that think, not my child. Well, I can tell you I thought that too. And now my child's not here. I never thought Brandon would ever do this. But now it's something I live with every day. You had said you see the pictures and you see the, you had seen in the past now that there were some warning signs, but are there other warning signs that maybe you feel you missed or something that you wish you'd seen? I didn't see any warning signs at all of Brandon using again mm -hmm. um, when he died. Absolutely none. Um, you know, I mean, he was going to work every day. And when Brandon was in his active addiction, Brandon would wake up sick in the morning. Mm -hmm. There were days that he would not go to work when he was in his active addiction. But from the time he got out of jail until the day he died, I saw no signs whatsoever of him using drugs again. I knew he was drinking, mm -hmm. but I did not know that he was using drugs again. Right. So I saw no signs. Right. How about looking back in the past, uh, way back when it first started, were there any warning signs that maybe you could, that other parents should look out for? If... Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, like I said, when his addiction first started, he was living with his dad. Mm -hmm. um, he was living in Centerville, I was living down here in Graysonville. And, um, but each time I would see him, I noticed that he was losing weight. Mm -hmm. So weight loss was one. Um, I also noticed that he wouldn't take a shower. He was always wearing dirty clothes. So hygiene was another, another sign. Um, he uh, just, the people he was hanging out with, the places he was going, you know, hanging out in a bad area of town or, um, and then he also got aggressive. Um, and Brandon was always this laid back guy, never, never got angry about anything, didn't raise his voice about anything. But um, when he didn't have a drug, he got very aggressive. Um, you know, he would cuss you in a heartbeat. Um, and it was all due to the drugs. Um, then of course, the getting in trouble with the law. Um, the stealing, you know, um, all those are, all of it was a sign, right. you know, um, getting in car accidents. He got into a car accident on Route 50. Um, he was coming home from Easton and there at the cat hospital on Route 50, um, he ended up rolling his car. He fell asleep, drifted off the road, hit the embankment and flipped, or hit the, um, hit the ditch and flipped the car. And he was ejected and so was his dog. Um, he landed in the slow lane on Route 50. And people were having to swerve to get around him. Well, I later found out in the letter that he wrote me that um, he fell asleep because he snorted seven Percocets. Um, so, you know, the car accidents was another sign with him. You know, he had wrecked several vehicles. So, pawning stuff, he was constantly pawning stuff. Like, he would sell anything. He sold, uh, he used to be an avid hunter, he used to hunt all the time. Um, he was a, he was an Eastern Shore redneck. You know, and that's what rednecks do. They go hunting all the time, hunting and fishing. And, you know, he hawked 
everything he had. He pawned every bit of it. You know, so I would start noticing things like that. So yeah, there was a lot of signs when he was in his active addiction, but I saw no signs when he died. And we had, you had touched on stigma and you touched on people that say, not my child. But mm-hmm. what would you like to tell parents to anyone who's watching who does think it could never happen to me? It's not my child. Or they, they had that stigma. Um, you need to open your eyes. Mm-hmm. The more you say, not my child, it's not going to happen to me. It's not going to touch my family. You will be the next one that it does touch. I said it all the time, all the time. Um, You need to educate yourself. I don't care what kind of childhood your child had, what you provide for your child, how well they've been raised. Drug addiction does not discriminate, period. No matter your age, your race, your religion, your wealth, it doesn't matter. Drug addiction does not discriminate. I noticed you're wearing your purple shirt. Absolutely. You you said that purple's now become your favorite color. It has. And when you see the county going purple and you see events like Not My Child and and everything else that's going around, do you feel like we're heading in the right direction? Um, As far as awareness Mm -hmm. and education, yes. Um, I believe the county is doing a very good job of getting the education out there and the awareness out there. Um, As far as resources, no, I don't. Uh, We need a lot more resources for this county. Mm. Um, We need, when an addict looks at you and says, I need help, they need help right now. Not eight o'clock tomorrow morning because it's five o'clock on a Thursday. They need help now. When they say they're ready, they're ready. You've got a very short time window to get them help. Um, And we just don't have that. You know, we don't have the safe stations like they have in Anne Arundel County, which is a good resource But, you know, I mean, that's not always a guarantee either Mm -hmm. to get them the help they need. Um, And it all comes down to beds and rehabs. We don't have beds and rehabs. You know, we don't have enough rehabs. Um, There are rehabs that offer the crisis beds. Um, But you got to go through so many hoops to get there, you know. And that's something that needs to change. We're losing too many people from this disease. Too many people. We need more resources. We need more rehabs. We need more sober living homes. We don't have many of those around here. You know, but there comes in the stigma again. Um, People don't want sober living homes in their neighborhoods because they're drug addicts. You know, they're all classified as junkies and, you know, they're no good. My son was not a junkie. He was a drug addict. He had a mental health issue. It's a brain disorder. And the sooner people start realizing that and start educating themselves and stop thinking it's a choice instead of a disease, It is a choice to pick it up the first time. But once you've picked it up, you can become addicted in one day. You know, so that's the part that irritates me. You know, and any mom that has lost a child deals with the same exact thing. They all feel the same way. You know, my son's addiction started from, you know, just going out and having a good time with his friends, wanting to party on the weekends with his friends. You know, just a casual thing. My son did not say, I want to be an addict when I grow up. That's not what my child wanted. My child wanted to be a police officer when he grew up. 
so that he could put the bad guys in jail. He didn't want to be the bad guy sitting in jail. You know, so we need, we need to educate. We need to bring the awareness, which we're doing, but we need to get more resources. They're just not available. You know, um, we need more meetings around here. We don't have enough meetings, AA or NA. You know, there's not many meetings down on Kent Island area. You know, there's good recovery in Chestertown and there's good recovery in Easton. Most addicts don't have a vehicle. Most addicts don't have transportation to get back and forth to a meeting. You know, so we need more meetings local. Um, I don't know what the resolution is going to be. I don't know how to solve the problem. Um, but I know that I'm not going to stop until I feel that I've made a difference.